Hello and welcome to the Luxury Living Podcast. On this podcast, we explore ideas and themes which are about making your luxury home more convenient and easier to live in. Um, if this is the first time you found this podcast, welcome. Uh, please tell your friends, your neighbors, your aunt, your uncle, anyone you can find about the podcast. But what would really be helpful for us if you could like it and if you could share it with other people. And so we can let other people know uh, the, about this podcast. I do the podcast uh, with Keith Brown from Dallas. Hey, Keith, how are you? I'm fantastic. So, Keith, um, this week we're going to explore uh, the five mistakes people make when doing or preparing for home automation. Um, what prompted you to think this would be a, a splendid idea for a podcast? Well, we've talked about some of the deeper ideas related to home automation, but we've never really done just kind of a surface level refresher course on what it means. And so if somebody were finding our podcast and they were just now thinking about building a smart home, but hadn't really gotten far down the road, we really haven't done much for them. So the idea was just to start building a series of podcasts where somebody just starting to look into it could kind of get their feet wet and understand the concepts. That's great. And you have for us two of uh, Bravis's crack team. Why don't you introduce them? I do. Yeah. So with us today, we have Brenna Owens, who was on our design and engineering team and just moved to Austin as one of our salespeople there. And Rob Carpenter, who is also part of our uh, national d &E team. Well, that's great. I couldn't think of two, two better people. And for those who don't know, our d &E team is our design and engineering team. So these are the people who are actually do the smart thinking to make sure if you buy a solution from Bravis, it will work together. So I think that's a great guy. So I'm going to throw it first to you, Brenna. Um, one of the first things we talk about with clients when they're building a house is pre-wiring. So can you tell us a bit about pre-wiring, what it is, and why it would be a bad thing to skimp on? Yes, thank you, Nigel. So pre-wire is the beginning process of laying out the groundwork for everything to be able to communicate within the home. And a lot of times people don't really think of how important that this process can be, but you really want to think about this is the groundwork to where you plan for your future, what you're going to be, where technology is going to go in the next five years. And you want to make sure that you have the wire to prepare for it. And what we have found is a lot of times homeowners will not realize the importance of it and skip back on not wiring all of the areas because they think that they're not going to be using it right now. But then two or three years later, they want to add that TV outside or add some outdoor living spaces and going back in to add that wire is it's, it's tough and it creates a really bad experience for a homeowner wanting to enjoy a smart home. Yeah, I think we, we hear this a lot from clients. They, uh, their initial concern is that the budget's going to climb really fast. And what they don't understand, especially in relation to the cost of building a luxury home in general, running wire to one or two extra zones when we're already in the house is really very, very cheap. And a lot of times if they've, let's say, never had distributed audio or music throughout all the rooms in their house, they think, well, a couple of rooms would be great. I've never had it before. Why would I need more than that? But then as soon as they experience it in their living room and on their patio, they want it in their bedroom and powder bath. And if it's not wired in some houses, it's nearly impossible to get that done. And Rob, it's more than just wire, not wiring to enough places, isn't it? They can they can put the the wrong stuff. I mean, I get, you know, do you put coax? Do you put five? You, you know, there's a lot of choice in there as well, isn't there? Yes, uh, there's a lot of different types of wiring, the drywall, the, the way that homes are constructed these days with cathedral ceilings throughout the, the center part of the home, typically, that makes it tougher to get wires where they need to be. But it's important to know what wires need to go where and prepare for the future. There's not any conduit in residences, typically. So what you put in initially, you've got to rip drywall down to get new wire in later if you have to. Um most of that wire goes back to a central area, doesn't it, Keith? It, like a patch panel or something. Um, when people are looking to build a home, it's worth making sure that space isn't too small, correct? Yeah, that's actually a problem we run into all the time, even with uh, architects that have worked on technology a lot in the past. So we do try and get involved really early in the process, usually while people are still planning 
uh, their home and are working in that early parts of the design phase just to make sure that whatever technology they do include, that there's a place for it to go and that that equipment can actually be cooled well, is going to have room, is going to be serviceable. Because uh, a lot of times if we're coming in too late into the process, we're actually just putting that equipment into cabinetry, uh, taking up clients' valuable storage space and making something that's harder to service and is going to reduce the life of the equipment. So, Brenna, you're sitting in front of a client and they go, well, I, I don't know why I need to wire everything. Everything's Wi-Fi now. It's all wireless. What would you say to that? It still needs power. So no matter how the communication is done, you still have to power the device. So if you're going to add power, you might as well add a Cat6 or a fiber or a, a wire that will power and communicate at the same time. Okay, Keith, so the first one is is not skimping on the pre-wire. The second one, when I look at our list, says that you shouldn't, and the words are piecemeal your system. So I don't know what that means. What What is piecemealing a system and why shouldn't they do it? Yeah, I think a lot of times we have clients that are really concerned about their budget, but uh, based on something we'll talk about in a little bit about just not trusting the person you're working with, uh, they want to do a little bit of custom install and a little bit of DIY product um, and, and kind of build something that feels to them like it's going to be a good value or going to work well. And, and a lot of times they won't communicate to their integrator, um, which is us, what they're planning to do. And there are a lot of times really easy ways that we can help them take those do-it-yourself products that work really well and actually help them work within our systems. Um, Brenna actually had a really good example of this. Um, when she was talking about either door stations or cameras or ring doorbells, um, we have some systems that do work well with them and some that don't. And if we know a client wants to have that technology, we can actually change the system we install for them to incorporate it. But if they just don't share it with us and just try and essentially just keep it out of the budget, they're going to end up with something where those systems don't really communicate with each other, which doesn't make their life much easier. Bruno, was that the example that he was talking about? Yeah, it, it happens a lot. And it's where, you know, the homeowner is trying to figure out ways that they can get their budget down. And really, it's a team effort. It's we're here to help you to, you know, provide you our industry experience and knowledge to help you come to the budget and into the experience that you want to provide or, or build in your home. And it's, it's all about communication and just sharing where you're trying to go. Rob, in our design and engineering team, you must see all the time people trying to make things that don't fit together, fit together. Is that something you have to live with? Oh, I've, I've been highly involved in many of those kind of projects. I had one project one time that was really interesting where the customer initially they had a lot of things they wanted us to incorporate into their system and we did and we made it work and then there was a uh, flood from a valve that had gone bad in the kitchen above and when that when that flood happened then we, i had the opportunity to actually redo everything it was awesome to actually get to redo the whole system the right way with the insurance money yeah, but Keith, I think it, there's an important difference, though, isn't there? That that someone like Bravis isn't just about you know we'll come and do this for you. When you when you have a relationship with Bravis, you're you're actually getting something practically different from just somebody doing the work for you, aren't you? Yeah, our goal is to really make something that changes the way someone lives in their home, not just makes it a little bit better, but essentially changes the way they interact with their home in every way. And yes, sometimes that do-it-yourself equipment can be included in that. But again, if you just kind of uh, tie our hands by not letting us know what you want to do, we're not going to know how to make those experiences better in every way. And we'll end up with a lot of places where we just kind of have blind spots. And instead of having this one app that allows you to communicate naturally with the entire home, you've got one app that controls 60% of the home and then 10 more that do the last 40%. And at the end of the day, that just leads to being frustrated with a system that maybe isn't all, you know, it was promised to be because we didn't have all the information to start with. So Rob, let, let's move on to number three. So, so you know, I, I spend a lot of my time as marketing and as the CEO talking about all the beautiful places we work and our slogan as a company is beautiful places, but it's also smart spaces. So the number three thing is, is not thinking through the infrastructure. So give us a sense what that means to you. 
Well, it's uh, the infrastructure is is you know part of the the skeleton of the system too, just like the pre-wire is, and it's your foundation for everything. It's not the exciting stuff, you know. If I'm if I'm building a home, and uh, me typically I'm going to be like, well, I want big speakers and I want big TVs and things of that nature, and that's what I want to spend money on. But you know, your your power infrastructure, uh, lightning strikes can wipe out every electronic in your home if you know if you don't have proper surge protection and not only along with surge protection there's power control and power conditioning and things of that nature so if you end up with a service issue or something isn't working right uh, you know you can call our service department and we can see what devices are on and off in the system if you have a, a strong infrastructure built up of, of components that can actually recognize what devices are powered on and off so Keith, uh, you know, we just talked about three different things here. We talked about having the right network, and we mentioned some of that earlier. The right power, the right serviceability. Do you, have, which do you think is the biggest? If there was a priority sequence, what, what would you say that was? Oh, that's tough. Um, I, I would compare it to saying, "What's the most important part of a tree to get you an apple?" At the end of the day. Like, yes, we have the pre-wire that would be the roots and then the infrastructure that's the trunk and the branches. And that's going to get us all those beautiful experiences at the end. But we need all of that stuff to actually deliver on what we've promised. So, you know, if you're in an area that doesn't have great power, it's probably going to be power. But I would say for most of our clients, the network is the thing that they're going to interact with every day. And not just when they're interacting with our system, when they're trying to work from home, trying to have their kids play games, uh, trying to stream movies, they deal with that and interact with it in every way, every day. And so if we can make sure that that is reliable and powerful and fast, and we can use the pre-wire to make sure that the devices that don't need to be on Wi-Fi aren't on Wi-Fi, then we're going to deliver the best possible experience to them when they're using their iPads and phones. Um, and it'll be really seamless, but it will also allow the rest of the system to work really well. So Brianna, I can imagine a client saying to us, well, you, you guys are bringing up all that stuff, but reality, my builder didn't talk to me about any of this. You know, why are you bringing up now? How would you answer that? Well, that's a tough question. Um, I think it's just more on, this is what we're here for. This is why there's a market for integrators for us to share our knowledge on what it takes to bring technology into the home. And that's not really necessary your builder's area of expertise. They're there to build you a quality home that keeps a roof over your head and that doesn't spring a leak or, or do the things that they're responsible for. So we're more of a partnership with your builder and helping bring that technology aspect to the home. You know, Keith, it's funny because I was talking to someone last week who was building a home and, you know, exactly what Brenna just said, that they had, the builder had almost avoided any of these things as a conversation. And so not, is it that they're scared of them? They don't want to get involved in them? What do you think, what should, what should a consumer be worrying or thinking about there? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. In some cases, there are, I think, builders and remodelers who are afraid of talking about technology because they don't understand it. And they are the expert when it comes to their home. So they understand almost everything that goes into it. They might not be able to cut down your countertops, but they understand how they work and how to support them and how to how to tie them into the home. So there is probably a fear aspect for some of them, but I think for some, they're never having to pass an inspection related to low voltage or to technology. So it's just not a priority. Once it gets to it, they'll typically say, oh yeah, we need to get this wired, but they're rarely thinking about it ahead of time because it just doesn't always end up on their priority list until they've really built that relationship with an integrator and experienced how much more complete that job is and how much happier the client is when they've actually thought about it all the way through. Now, Rob, when you're designing these systems, often we put into a home a, a whole rack. Now, there are things we can do to that rack for remote management, aren't there? So it, so it means we can sort of help support them from a distance. What are some of those things we do? Well, there's, there's a lot of tricks there. You know, there's one trick that I like to do. The Samsung Frame TV is very popular right now. 
and uh, it's a beautiful piece and it, it looks like a piece of art on your wall. And one trick I like to do with that one is put a back box, which we haven't talked about that yet, to house the equipment. And a good example there is the Apple TV. I'm a big fan of the Apple TV. It's a great device, but sometimes it locks up. So what I do is I, I put a power conditioner in the back box that has a tr momentary trigger that I can then hide somewhere, say at the top of the frame of the TV, where nobody will see it. But if that Apple TV locks up, I can show the customer, hey, if, if this ever happens, just press this little button we've hidden up here, and then it'll reboot the Apple TV. You don't have to have a service call. You don't have to pull the TV off the wall and all those sort of things. And I can also put one of those triggers on the rack because a common issue is the, uh, the cable company has updated your cable boxes and now nothing works right. Well, I can reboot those. I can have a momentary trigger set up to where the customer can reboot those cable boxes or the cable modem or something of that nature. Things that typically give us issues that aren't even our, our components. You know, I, w I wonder whether anyone has a sense of, uh, you know, we do very complicated home theaters and other systems. How many of the things that break could be fixed just by rebooting them? What, does anybody have an idea? 150%. Yeah. <laughs> so so it's, it's funny. I used to work for a, a, very, a large company where, you know, the guy, the CEO used to say we have more, more noble laureates working for us than any other company in the world yet. When I have a problem with my PC, Nine out of ten of them suggest I just turn it off and turn it on on again, and I guess that's that's true for some of this automation as well. Um, so uh, I'd like to move on to number four, Keith, and I, I think you know I don't want this to be too self-serving, but but I think you know we do a lot of takeover of other projects from other companies, which is why number four is picking the wrong partner. Why? What is that? Yeah, I knew it would sound self-serving, but it really isn't intended to be. Um, there's a chance that somebody might meet with one of our salespeople and not develop a really high level of trust with them. I, and I do think we choose people that can be trusted and we give them the infrastructure to allow them to do their jobs really well. But the reason I say choosing the right partner is so important is if you don't really trust the person that you're talking to and you're not willing to kind of put some of your budget and your trust in their hands, it's probably not a good fit for you. The way that we build really useful systems for our clients is we have conversations with them about how they're going to live in the home, you know, who's in their family, what do they expect to be doing five years from now, and really grasping how they use the home, grasping what's going to be important to them, and then building a system that kind of fills in those gaps and answers those questions. We don't just have a cookie cutter system that will work for everyone because some of the stuff we sell, you know, person A simply may not need. Well, person B would think it would be absolutely fantastic to have. And so uh, to me, the biggest thing with choosing the right partner is finding somebody that you can trust, but also has the resources to complete the job that you're doing. Bruno, it's, it, it's quite difficult, isn't it, for a client? Because there are just so many choices. There are just so many, you know, options and versions and there's good, better, best. And there's that. How do you help a client understand or go through the process to work out what's right for them? I think it goes back to what Keith said. It's, it's conversations about how they live their life. So we're gonna walk through a floor plan and we're gonna look at their kitchen and find out, you know, is this your main family gathering place? Is this where y'all eat your meals or do you eat it in a breakfast room area? Or, you know, it's just basic everyday habits of your lifestyle. and you want to have that trustworthy relationship where you feel comfortable sharing those things. And then that's how you find out what's going to work for them. So someone that's, you know, living in a security, uh, a very high security neighborhood, having security, um, a lot of security in their home is not, may not be a, a big thing for them, but someone who doesn't have a gated neighborhood or, patrol that may be at the top of their list. And so those are little things that we're trying to pick out of conversation. So that way we know to show a lot more offerings in that area to give them an idea of what's available because it, it's custom and that that's what custom means. There's just so many things that you can do to build that right system for each individual. And it's always different. You know, when I think about our solution guide, I, I, you know, our solution guide is full of fabulous pictures. You, people can get it off the website of jobs that we've done. 
end. But there are lots of lots of company could say would show you a fancy picture and pretend they've done it. But we've really done those jobs. And I I wonder, Rob, how important do you think it, like our central design and engineering team is to really understanding that the sheer volume of proposals we're going through makes us able to learn and implement faster. And I wonder whether you've seen that from that that position. Oh yes, definitely. And it's not only just from the design and engineering team, because we, we do try to have some good synergy. You know, I'm always curious to hear feedback of, from the service techs and, and the salespeople and everybody in the company, because the, the service techs, they're, they're usually your greatest insight into what's working well together uh, what can we do to make things be more reliable? Certain pieces of equipment work better together than others. It's constantly evolving, constantly changing. You know, this that's what technology does. And, and so, Keith, how, how do you uh, have a conversation with a customer who says, um, look, you know, I, I look at your proposal. It, it looks pretty big. There's a lot of parts. There's a lot of pieces. There's a lot of labor. It seems to be a lot more labor than, you know, the guy Nick, the other proposal that I'm seeing. You know, why are you so much labor? Well, what are your thoughts when you get hear that? Well, I mean, and that's something that we have heard in the past. And I would say for the most part, one of the benefits of being Bravos is that we're doing 10, 15, 20 times more jobs every year than your average AB company. So we do have a really good understanding of what it really takes for us to do these jobs and do them well. We're not guessing, we're not estimating, we're not writing down a big number and going, ooh, that's too big, let me make that smaller so the client will buy it. At the end of the day, we know what it costs and we have centralized design and engineering like Rob to put together a real proposal based on the actual time it will take. And then that's the proposal we sell because that's what allows us to go in and do the job right and not feel rushed at the end or not taking a loss. Because if we're taking a loss on jobs, then we're not going to be able to support them long term into the future. Um, and that's really not in our client's best interest. And the other thing, Rob, which I'm always very impressed with is you guys look through those proposals for all the little bits and connectors and middle parts that, that other people might not think of that another vendor may come back and say, oh, I forgot that it's just another few hundred dollars to do this. You, you've you really thought it through end to end, haven't you? Oh, definitely. I always see this as, as putting puzzles together, you know, and, and nobody likes change orders that are, you know, they like positive change orders where maybe the customer gets a little money back at the end, but the, nobody wants to spend more than what they'd anticipated. So we try to avoid surprises like that. Okay, Brenda. So let let's do let's do number five, which which I wonder whether a year ago we might have found a different number five, but with all the stuff going on in the world, this one seems to be quite important, particularly at this point in time, which is don't wait too long. Why should why should clients or customers be nervous about waiting too long? Well, the big thing is shipping, right? So the containers are backed up overseas. A lot of the electronic parts are just like, not the whole piece, but the individual parts are made uh, not in the US. So it, it, it's become a thing here lately. And, you know, the shipping times have gone longer than what they used to be, especially a year ago. So just really getting ahead of everything so that way you're not in the situation to where you feel the pressure that you have to make a decision because of equipment not being available and you want to move in. And so we, we just don't want the client to have to have that added pressure with that already comes with building a new home. That's already a lot to deal with. And so the earlier that you have a conversation, it will help us plan better for what it, technology you're wanting to add. So not only do we have to deal with the long shipping rates, but we also want to get ahead of the other contractors that your builder works with to make sure that we're having the right conversations with them ahead of time. So they're not having to do change orders because of what you added with us. And it just really helps make us all work as a team with your builder and not just coming in and then making changes. But Keith, that is clearly the biggest issue in our industry at the moment is, is the supply chain. But in terms of the design of the home, if you leave some things too late, 
There's just some things you can't get because we just won't be able to do them in time. Is that right? Absolutely. That's correct, Nigel. I think about just bringing an interior designer in at the end of a job when it's all said and done and the paint colors are chosen and the flooring's in. All they can really do at that point is pick the furniture, choose some artwork and work in the existing space. You want to have them in early so that they're helping design the space that you want from the ground up. In the same way, that's what we're trying to do. So if you think that hanging a TV on a wall takes more planning than setting a TV on a piece of furniture, hanging an art TV takes even more planning because we're going to want it placed exactly where you would place the artwork. So that might mean more thought putting put in behind exactly where power and wiring is going to come out of that wall. Well, if you want to have a hidden TV, maybe that pops up out of a cabinet when you turn it on, that takes even more planning. And that's just not something that we can do affordably after the fact. Yeah, there's some, um, maybe there's not some great, at all. Yeah, I mean, there's some great video on our website at the moment of a, of a in a home theater where the projector comes out of the roof and the TV comes out of the wall. And if the projector is going to come out of the roof, the roof can't be finished, I'm guessing. It's a lot more expensive if it's already finished. Yes. I mean, typically that, you know, a projector like that's not, you know, you want it exactly centered on the screen, exactly centered in the room. And when the framer is framing that ceiling, he's absolutely not thinking about leaving space for your projector dead center of the room. So that's the kind of thing that we would need to know well before framing so that we could discuss that. So we could plan around it if needed. Um, we've even had installs where, um, they've had to change the direction framing was running to make something work the way we needed it to. And that's a, essentially a no cost option prior to construction, but could be a lot bigger expense if we decide late in the process that, you know, we want to make it work the way the client wants it, or they're going to have to make some sort of compromise. And ideally we'd rather do neither. Yeah. I always think also that, that, you know, the later you, uh, you leave it the less value you're going to get for your money because it's going to be more expensive to do things and therefore you're going to get less value for the money. And so you may end up spending the same amount, but you may get less for that money. Yeah, absolutely. Us using our brain power early on is free. Um, using manpower to change things down the road is is a lot more expensive. So Rob, I just want to come back to you know something that Brenna said that that I think is I think it's worth underlining. Because, you know, if I was a cynical person out there, I might say, yeah, well, of course, Bravis is going to say there are long lead times because um, that way they we can, they can get my money earlier. Um, you sit in the middle of much of this through design and engineering team. Uh, how, how have you seen lead times change in the last few weeks and months? Oh, there's definitely been a lot of delays. Um, but I try to plan ahead on that end too. You know, when I look at the options, when a customer, when I get a sales intake from the salesman saying, you know, giving me notes about the design, I, I look at the, the notes and design and, and I already know certain items that are going to be back ordered and things of that nature. So I'll let, I'll have a conversation with the salesman pretty quickly to, to find out what we're dealing with timeline wise for the project and see if it's going to work with the products that they're wanting. And otherwise we'll plan for, a workaround. You know, the other, the other thing that you want to think about too, is we don't build our equipment on site. So we also like to have enough time. So that way we can test out your rack and make sure that everything that arrived is working properly. Because a lot of times it doesn't sometimes you know, it's just get a bad piece of equipment and you have to send it back or it's not doing what it's supposed to. So having that extra time as well allows us to bring a rack over that's fully functional and ready to power up and, and start working. Um, so it, there's a lot of lead time, a lot of things that need to happen in between that. Yeah, and I guess even though you know you buy by a Crestron system or a Savant system or a Control Four or a Lutron or an Alan system, that doesn't mean we're not getting parts from lots of different suppliers, all of whom are on different lead times and different delivery schedules. Yeah, we, we don't want the determining factor of your budget to be what we can get our hands on at the last minute. So if somebody is building a really high-end theater and they want a $6,000 surround receiver because that's what's going to power their system, that's a great choice for them to be able to make. We don't want you to have to have one in your living room because that's the only product that was available. And so that's definitely one of the reasons that we want people to think ahead beyond just being able to build out a better experience. We don't want to delay their system after closing or have to change pricing just 
because we had our hand forced. All right. So we've talked about the five mistakes that people make when planning their smart home. I thought we would wrap up by uh, by asking each of us to think through what if you were in front of a client from your experience and and uh, from what you've seen. What's where would you look first? What would be the first thing you would tell them to look at to make sure they're successful in doing a great uh, home automation project? Keith, where, where if there was just one thing a client should do, what would you tell them? Be honest. Uh, be honest about what you do want, what you don't want, what you don't see value in. Do not let us sell you something that is of no value to you because um, that's of no value to us. But at the same time, you don't have to lie about how you live. Um, I have two of my favorite stories where clients who were, um, who actually asked us to have their shades open up in the morning at a certain time of day, like 6 a.m. And then a week later, they came back and said, no, 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 please make that stop. I really don't get up until eight. I just didn't want to admit it. Um, and a client who told us, I never watch TV in my bedroom. I, that's where you go to sleep. And a year later, we're installing a TV in the bedroom and in the kitchen because he's like, I do watch TV when I eat breakfast. And that sounded so immature that I just said I didn't want one, but I do. Um, so just be honest with what you want. Like we can build a system that will help you live your ideal life, but only if we know what that is. I think there's a whole nother train there, Rob, which we shouldn't go down to, which is the most embarrassing thing we've been ever asked to do. But uh, <laughs> that, that might lead us into being banned or, or, or you know, censored or something. But what about you? If one of your friends is I'm going to do a project, where would you tell them to start? I'd say just talk to your friends, you know, and use use the internet. Learn a little bit, but be careful with advertising. I won't mention any specific names, but there's one very popular product line out there that everybody in the industry kind of mocks and makes fun of because their products aren't that good. And uh, we the the ins insider joke of the industry was always better sound through advertising. Yeah, and I, I think that that's a good point, particularly when you look at products from companies who are more consumer than maybe more what we think of as as sort of residential luxury they sound really easy and they work really well but they don't scale very well and you know i was joked someone said to me oh, well i went to a went to a window provider and you know he gave me a great automated shade and i said well what happened and and it's got this great remote and i said well, what happens if you had like 25 windows in the house well then i'd have 25 remotes and that sort of that would probably not be a, a very well implemented solution so right you brenna what what if you were with a friend who said to me said to you where should we start where, what would you tell them um, I would go back to the whole trust thing. You know, again, you're relying on us to to give you good information, solid information. And this is not your forte. This is what we live and breathe day in and day out. So find someone that you trust. So whenever they tell you that that's not going to work together or, you know, maybe consider doing another solution or uh, consider another um Op option and you'll trust their instinct and you'll trust their judgment and so that that'll go a long way and not even the beginning of the process but at the end of the process whenever you're living in the home and you're trying to get your experience that you paid for i think that's the perfect note on which to end up saying thanks very much for everybody who's listening to the podcast and for the team joining us on it thanks very much